I have the privilege today to speak to the composer Kevin Volans, who was listed by the BBC Music Magazine as one of the 50 most important living composers. Currently, Kevin has nearly 140 compositions on his work list and nearly 50 recordings of his works, of which some broke records for disc sales and they are regularly performed worldwide. With the support of the South African Society for Research in Music and the Goethe Institute, Kevin is currently in South Africa and presented a four-day lecture series at the Goethe Institute in Johannesburg, about which we will talk today. Thank you very much for joining me, Kevin. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. I, I was intrigued by the influences of Caroline Stockhausen on your compositions. To what extent are your compositions currently influenced by your studies in Cologne, and what else had strong influences on your music? Uh, that's an almost impossible question to answer. I mean, uh, it's 50 years ago or so. Um, but obviously he was the first big influence on my compositional work. But subsequently there were other composers like Morton Feldman. But I would probably say the biggest influence on my work is contemporary visual art, rather than anything to do with music in a way. Right. And, but Stockhausen became synonymous with, with electronic music. Uh, this is also the focus of Irkam in Paris, uh, for which you were commissioned to write music when they opened in 1977. Which composition was performed at the opening event and to what extent do you work with electronic music? Okay, it was a series of concerts called The, the Contemporary Soloist and Herbert Hank, the pianist, asked me to write a piece for his particular concert. Uh, so, um, I wrote a piano piece, I mean, uh, it was called Monkey Music, uh, um, which is, I've kind of abandoned, but I used part of it in my fifth piano etude. I did see that you reworked that, that piece later on. Yeah, <laughs> a dozen times it's been cut to pieces, <laughs> that particular piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I read that you studied engineering and architecture before you went to Cologne. Uh, I find many metaphoric parallels between the working procedures of architects and composers, uh, which include sketching and constructing in creative ways, but within specific frameworks and according to specific principles. Uh, what is the role of sketching in your composition process? Um, well, I used to do a lot of sketches, uh, but I realized at a certain point that what I set out to do in the sketches had really nothing to do with the final result. So I don't uh, use any sketching these days. I start straight away with the, with the piece, so to speak. I have to wait, though, before I start work. I mean, until I have what I feel is a, is a fruitful beginning, something that will generate the rest of the piece. So this idea to start compositions at, at the first bar was, was part of your advice for young composers uh, at your lecture series. But how do you then plan the larger structure of, of the oh, composition? Yeah, no, hold on, I've got to correct that. <laughs> I mean, it's a way of working. It's not the way of working. I mean, of course. I was trained to work quite in the reverse, like to plan a whole piece in advance. And many people do that. Um, I was trying to give certain tips for people who, who were having problems composing. I wasn't suggesting they work from the first bar. But I was suggesting, well, if they don't know what to do, mm -hmm. find a good first bar and then work from there. I mean, that was just, that even is not really what I would advise, but um, I was trying to set out all these various possibilities of working, different ways of working, and, and not, n not to get bogged down with ideas in advance. I have to go further than that. I was trying to... Get, get the idea across that in order to write a piece you have to start writing, working with material and not start with finished, finished music but, but rather find a usable piece of material and from which you would then develop a piece. So it's a very... Um, so many people have this problem that they start writing the piece and they start as it were with finished material. They start with a piece of music rather than a piece of material and then immediately get bogged down because they don't know what to do next. I understand. So it's a quite a different sort of 
thing. And in a way, this comes from architecture, because in architecture we were taught first to look at what materials you have, what materials are you building with, before you design the building. Um, that's not always the case, of course, in ar architecture. I mean, very often you have a brief and, and you then have to decide are you going to do this thing and therefore you have to use those materials. It's very sort of chicken and the egg. But I, I feel that, that if, if a young composer starts with the material and looks at the material, they will find a solution to the compositional problem rather than starting with an idea about the material. Uh, and working that way. Uh, but in, if you compose, do you do it directly onto the computer then? I do, I start writing on the computer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're not only a composer but also a pianist who performed several of your own works on piano and harpsichord. What are the advantages and disadvantages of performing your own music as a composer? Well, I mean, throughout history composers have performed their own work. I mean, all the you know, I mean, Mozart, Beethoven, they were all a list. Right. Uh, m many of them were performers, and uh, not all. And it does have this advantage that you can, you give the premiere of the piece, and the premiere very often sets the tone for how the piece is supposed to be played. I mean, a piece of music, uh, what's written on the page is only half of the information. There's always a big oral... Uh, oral and oral tradition that goes with every piece of music. So if you are the first performer, you can establish in what kind of style that you want the piece to be played. Because notation is inadequate, it doesn't give you every detail. Um, but the disadvantage of that is that you can't place yourself in the, in the audience uh, and hear the work with somebody else's ear. So you're very involved in the technical difficulties of playing the piece. So it's a, very, it's a different role altogether to be the performer as well. And I've st I, I have to emphasize I'm no longer a pianist. I gave my last performance about three years ago. Right. Yeah. But if young composers are performing their, their own works, that can certainly be a way to promote your own music. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's cheaper as well. You don't have to pay yourself. I mean, it's quite a big advantage. <laughs> uh, I now want to move on to your composition White Man Sleeps for two harpsichords, viola da gamba and percussion, which is a pioneering composition among South African composers that most people and scholars associate with you. Despite this being an early work and the fact that you wrote many large-scale works afterwards that uh, probably represent your well-established compositional voice better, uh, academics hardly talk or write about your music without referring to White Man Sleeps. If, if you had the possibility of steering this discourse uh, about the composition, what would you say? I wouldn't want to steer the course of that kind of... I'm not <laughs> particularly interested, in a way, with what people say about the work. I mean, I try to avoid, nowadays, uh, finding out what people are saying. But... Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's easy to write about a work that's already been written about, so uh, it, it kind of generate, it's self-generating. But also in the recent years I've been so prolific uh, in a way that um, I think I've written much better stuff. Um, but nobody's caught up with it, and I don't write about my own work, so um, there's nothing written about it. I, I noticed that there are hardly any program notes on your works and you also avoid in some of the compositions programmatic titles in the more recent compositions. Are these also ways in which you then try to avoid writing about your music? Well, yeah, I mean, the music is uh, anti-conceptual, so to write about it is really a contradiction in terms. Uh, and I've also found that if you give a piece a title, uh, then you get people writing about the title and not understanding that very often a title is just a name. You know, you could equally call the piece Daisy or John, <laughs> um, but you find a title that doesn't sound stupid. Um, but basically, uh, most of the pieces are not about what the title says. I mean, an example is uh, my two piano piece, Cicada. 
Uh, I called it Cicada, I named it after Jasper John's painting. Right. But um, the piece was really more influenced by the work of a different artist altogether, James Turrell. Uh, but Cicada's got cross-hatching, uh, the, the painting has got a lot of cross-hatching, and the piece has got the two pianos interlocked in a similar kind of way. So I gave it that name, but it, that name is only to indicate that the piece is, uh, the inspiration for the piece comes from contemporary art. Uh, and um, the title, Cicada, I mean, you do get people who try and find out, uh, listen to the influence of, of insects Cicada. and not understanding that it has nothing to do with the insects at all. So it's risky to give a piece a title because you very often get a kind of programmatic response. You, d you limit the way people hear the piece. And talking about your compositions, I noticed on your list of compositions, the, uh, or on your work list, uh, that some of the compositions have been withdrawn. Although recordings of some of the withdrawn works exist, uh, further performances of these works are not permitted. Uh, why did you withdraw these works from your work list? Well, I mean, mainly I withdrew pieces because I wasn't happy with them. I didn't think they were good enough. Uh, um, many composers have done this. I mean, Brahms tore up all his early work, <laughs> for example. Um, uh, and, and in some instances, I wrote the pieces for a specific commission, like the trumpet and string quartet was for the trumpet biennale. And um, I thought there was something interesting in the material, uh, but for a different setting. So I rewrote it and made it a much larger piece and then scrapped the original. I see. So if I have to advise a young, com a young composer to listen to your works for the first time, which works would you recommend and why? Well. <laughs> I wouldn't really want to advise anyone. You know what I mean? I think they should find their own... I mean, they don't have to listen to anything I do. <laughs> uh, it's a very difficult question. I, I, I've never advised people to listen to my music. So you don't have um, something that you feel is almost a seminal type of... a seminal work of your oeuvre? Not really. I mean, because every decade I've been... Um, focused on a different topic, so to speak. And the 80s was, starting in 1980, I mean, was this idea of a reconciliation of African and European aesthetics. But by the end of that decade, decade that didn't really interest me anymore, because as soon as apartheid came to the end, I felt that what I had to say on the subject was of no relevance. Uh, and I felt that I'd been rendered obsolete by, by the political situation, in a way. So, I mean, I, I was focused on something quite different. And what is your topic of the past decade, then? Uh, well, I, I mean, I've said in another interview that the ultimate aim uh, for any composer is freedom. And that means freedom from your own preconceptions, freedom from restrictions, freedom from caring about what other people think about your work. And as you get older, actually, I think it naturally you start feeling freer. Um, and so I would say in the last decade, I felt free to write anything that, I mean, uh, every piece has got a different interest or different. Who is, who is the wild girl of Darmstadt to <laughs> whom you dedicated 1,000 bars? Um, she was an ex-student of mine. I mean, I had... Uh, Jennifer Walsh and she came for classes and then I advised all the students to go to Darmstadt and uh, she went and the next thing um, she came back and she was at my door with a big bunch of flowers and I said what's this for and she said well I won the Kronigsteiner Prize which is the, the most prestigious prize in contemporary music in, Brit in Europe and uh, so I said, I told you to go to Darmstadt. I didn't tell you to win the prize. You <laughs> know <what> I mean, <laughs> and, um, she's a, a wild performer. She's a, a very dramatic uh, vocal performer, and she does a lot of theatre pieces. So it was just a private joke, really. I 
And would you still recommend students to go to Darmstadt? I think students should go to everything, yeah. I mean, Darmstadt is not what it used to be, but it is a place where hundreds of composers now, I think, or at least a hundred composers get together. So you do get to see what other people, that's why I recommended it, to go and see what other people are doing. Which is important. Uh, it's a very important, and for the most part, because they were all very good students, I knew that they would realize how good they were by seeing what other people were doing. And I think that's very good for a composer to have a positive experience like that piece. All right. How, how important is collaboration for you as a composer? It, it, well, it's fun to collaborate with other people. And, and you sometimes arrive at very different um, solutions. I, I mean, I think the biggest influence on any work is the venue. I mean, if you know that you're writing for the Albert Hall, like as in a proms commission, you don't write the same kind of thing that you would write for a room like this. And uh, with some of these collaborations, I mean, they're like dance, and you know that it's going to be five people on the stage, and there's going to be lighting, and, there's going, and it's going to have a certain kind of an audience and be for a certain length of time, yes. and so on. So you, um, you work accordingly, and you sometimes ri arrive at new solutions. I mean, a very clear example of this was I, I was asked to do music for an exhibition by Jürgen Partenheimer, a German artist, right. and he did, he works in, in three kind of categories, painting, ceramics, and sculpture. And, and I've been to so many exhibitions, if there's music, basically, what happens is that the people just talk louder. I mean, uh, you know, music at an uh, uh, exhibition opening in particular is usually catastrophic from that point of view. So, uh, knowing that it was going to be an exhibition over a number of rooms, I decided to write for three ensembles in three different spaces. I think we had six rooms of work, so there were uh, there was an ensemble performance in, in every room. Yeah, right? and I wrote it for three ense different ensembles, which related in my mind closer one to painting, one to sculpture, and one to ceramics. And then I decided to have them playing simultaneously. I mean, I knew that you would be able to hear one th them from different rooms, and then decided to have them playing simultaneously at different tempos, which was quite a diff difficult, technically quite difficult. I mean, I had to do a lot of work to do that. And, um, but I loved the idea of having these sounds coming from different parts of the exhibition. And it, 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 it took a lot of work, but it was really interesting what happened as a result, because um, what happened was that uh, people, because they were hearing music from the other space, or then suddenly from here, and then suddenly from behind them, uh, it aroused their curiosity, and they would start moving. I mean, and with the very first performance, I mean, these whole groups of people started moving to different so, rooms. Because yeah. I silenced some of, you know, the, some of the group would stop playing, and then they would start. And, um, and then at a certain point, they sort of settled down, and it's quite a long piece, it's like 45 minutes or something. And they would settle down and just listen from one point. Um, but because people could move around, it was very liberating for them. I mean, I was absolutely astonished how uh, the music was not easy, and nobody left. I mean, <laughs> and then we had a second performance, and there were a number of children there, and the children loved it. I mean, because they could go and stand behind the performers, and they could see what they were doing. Uh, the whole thing to coordinate it all was all coordinated by computer and there were click tracks and they were flashing red and green lights to give the pulse to the right. to the players and and the children were sort of tippy toeing around and looking and they were just they just loved it and i thought uh, this is something i've never done before and it was really 
interesting. Uh, you know, I mean, the result, I was very happy with the result. And I never would have arrived at that if I hadn't had this collaboration. Yes. Sorry, that's a very long answer to a <laughs> short question. Well, another collaboration that I'm interested in is the one with William Kentridge on Confessions of Zeno. Oh, yeah, that was a very different kettle of fish, so to speak, yeah. Because that's a theatre piece. Um, I don't know what you want to know about it. I mean, it was, you know, we had a speaker, we had an actor and a singer in the first part and a string quartet and, and projections uh, that William had done, plus the Handspring Puppet Company. So it was working on many different things at the same time. And the second half, then we had um, two sopranos and a bass and an actor and projections and re pre-recorded sound with, with four singers. Um, and were you involved right from the beginning of the, the start of the project? Yes, yeah. Great. Um, the Mountain That Left was composed for the BBC Singers uh, in celebration of 20 years of democracy in South Africa and it is dedicated to Nelson Mandela. Can you please tell me more about this composition? Um, well, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a piece that still hasn't been performed because there were technical problems with the first performance. It was very unfortunate because it was also composed for the 90th birthday of the BBC Singers uh, to the day of their 90th birthday and there was a big gap <laughs> on the program. Um, but they commissioned this piece and I wrote it for 24 voices singing a 24 part counterpoint plus 10 Song. instruments also in counterpoint plus soprano solo and I, I mean I was kind of free to choose the topic and I chose the topic that it would of, right. of Mandela really but the soloist um, there's again working with the materials I mean uh, we knew the soloist was going to be Pumeza Machikiza, whose voice I love, I mean, and she's a wonderful singer. So I decided to include Tosa texts, uh, and then once you get to that, that sort of leads to other things. The whole piece is about bereavement, but it's in four languages, um, and it's classic poetry from Spanish, uh, English, and French, as well as Cosa. Written in the 1920s, am I right? The Cosa, yes, yeah. I mean, um, uh, kind of revolutionary poetry by Nazi C. Um, Gret. Uh, you mentioned in your first lecture that you often attend contemporary art exhibitions and you also mentioned it earlier. And the importance of art was stressed throughout your lectures. Uh, do you draw inspiration from art? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just the way your brain works. I mean, with some people, it doesn't work. But if I if I want to get an idea, or if I, I'm commissioned to write something and I'm still it's still blank, if I go to art shows, I almost immediately know what I'm going to write. And mainly contemporary art. Yeah, usually it's it's uh, brand new stuff. Yeah. Great. Uh, I related well to the part of dancing in the dark where you write that musical content can be understood but not described, at least not in terms of an obsolete reality. And then later you write, if, they, if there are to be no fixed laws of composition, no formal concepts, then musical discussion, even of technique, needs to be via imagery or metaphor. Metaphors play a major role in how people understand music and describe music, both practically and in theory. Uh, what is your role? What is the role of metaphors in the way you, as composer, think think about composition? Well, I would say I work more in terms of images than metaphor, but right. um, um, that's why contemporary art gives me images. You know, even at the sort of side of your eye, you you catch a a, bit, a glimpse of something, and that gives you a. a a sense of what to do. Uh, it's very difficult to explain the process. Yes, of um, course, because it's a very inherent... But I mean, I, with Cicada it's quite fairly easy. I had been to this uh, exhibition of James Turrell in, in, in Kilkenny, I think, 
James Turrell is an artist, American artist who works in term, with light only, and one of his most sort of famous things that he does is creates these kind of light boxes. You sit in a box, okay, and it's got curving walls and then a square cut out at the top. And we all went there. I mean, this was an opening, so and a certain number of people got to sit inside the box and it's lit on the inside and it was I mean deliberately around about sunset so as you sit there the sky which um, looks blue in fact it was grey but but because of the internal lighting colour of the internal mm -hmm. light the sky looked blue because of the contrast and then it gradually turned to jet black and then when it got to that point, he said, uh, you know, he was there, and he said, just, just as a matter of interest, I'm going to turn the lights off. And he turned the lights off, and we were looking at a grey sky again. Um, anyway, I was starting work on Cicada at the time, and I was staying with friends, and I went to stay with them, and they had this minimalist house. And I woke up to see uh, exactly the same sort of thing, a square of glittering light, it was the sea. And I just had this idea immediately of doing a piece where nothing happened, except gradually it went from blue to black. <laughs> you know, so that was, so I wrote a note to myself, like, no composition. No, and by composition I meant interfering with what happens, no event, a sort of a, uh, an event-free kind of music that started with something that just gradually got deeper into the colour and, and blacker as it went on. It so that sort of was the... Ins that's an example of how an image, a, a visual image, can give you a kind of starting point for a piece. Yes. It, it reminds me of the image I, I got yesterday with a performance of Spurt that you wrote for Waldo Alexander's mm -hmm. birthday. Oh yes, well, um, <laughs> what were you going to say? The, the <laughs> idea that the, <clears throat> about the this, this Spur, which, which means trail of an animal. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm not sure what came first, the title or, or the piece, but I definitely wanted to write a piece that just hovered like midday light in in the bush felt yes and then with these just tiny indications of something because it's really interesting if you go on trails you know and the, the game range or the game guide will say oh look buffalo and you look and you see sort of nothing <laughs> and then they point to these tiny little things which indicate and those were the little that, patterns um, in the piano right yeah and I, so i decided to just have these kind of tiny i mean it was just I don't know. I mean, calling it spur was a, a cop-out. I, I sort of felt I justified the piece. But, you know, um, the other piece on the programme, Viola Piano, that was another piece that I wrote in the Karoo. I mean, I had the house, this house in the Karoo. And I think a lot of music from that time, I mean, spur is quite recent, but it, harking back to that period. Um, I was definitely influenced by the environment, that kind of austere but very beautiful Karoo environment where um, like unless you see it in early morning or late evening you don't quite understand just how beautiful it is yes and um, with all these little sounds and I mean there was always while I was composing there were always birds it was quite interesting if you played music they actually came closer to the house <laughs> they sort of <laughs> saw it as a competition so, I mean, yesterday we had that jet going over and we also had a bird singing outside and they, for me they just, um, the jet was like thunder, you know, yes. moving slowly across. And I thought, this is absolutely fine, it fits, it fits, <laughs> it the, fits yeah. the music. It, I, I, I thought the jet was particularly well timed. <laughs> right. So, comp composing a, a music work can take years to complete. And although scholars sometimes frown upon composers who work fast, we know that composers such as Bach, Telemann, Mozart, among many others, composed Handel. music. Handel composed music in, in, in sh significant short periods of time. 
Uh, I believe that this is true for your string quartet number six and concerto for double orchestra. Uh, and I want to know what enabled you to compose these works in such a short time and how can young composers prepare to work optimally and in, in a short period of time? Uh, well, yes, to go back to your question um, first, uh, I think the length of time that it takes to write a piece is irrelevant. Irrelevant. I mean, the Prague Symphony was two days, I think, that Mozart wrote it. I mean, <laughs> you know, and you could not hardly improve on it. And the Messiah, two or three weeks. Weeks, yeah. Uh, for one of the major masterpieces of our entire culture. So, um, I usually, I mean, it's not just one or two pieces, and most of my pieces are finished within three weeks or two weeks. Right. I mean, uh, pieces between 20 and 30 minutes. Uh, something like that part and I'm a piece which is longer and very complex so it obviously took longer to write yes. um, but um, it depends on how you measure the compositional time because from from the from the time you get the commission to the time you start writing is usually quite a long pre-compositional period where I'm just waiting to be focused I mean, to have a very clear in my mind what I'm going to do. I mean, not, what, not literally what I'm going to do, but where I want to move, what area I'm going to work in. Because um, with commissions, it's nearly always you're given the instruments. Correct. So you know that. That's a sort of given. And you're also very often given a duration, you know, like 20 to 25 minutes. Or the last commission I had, they wanted 30 minutes. They didn't want more or less, exactly. which is kind of tricky. Uh, I gave them 29 minutes, 45 seconds, <laughs> and they're going to regret that because it's very hard. <laughs> but anyway, so I wait uh, and I do things to, you know, um, just waiting for your mind to be ready to start work. So that's quite a long period and, and, and it can be just a day. I mean, you go to the right art exhibition and you know exactly what you're going to do. Um, but, um, and I do have some false starts. Sometimes you think you know what you're going to do and you start and you realize it's completely wrong. Fortunately, I think as you get more experience, you'd, that happens less and less. <coughs> so I haven't really thrown away anything. Uh, Recently. So what would you say if someone really has a very short period of time and they need to write a large-scale composition? Is there something that you can... Should you change your environment in a way? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on their circumstances. Most, most people are, would be very stupid to accept a commission for a large-scale work in a very short period of time. But um, you just have to take a deep breath and start work. It kind of ha I happened to me with one of my pieces where the circumstances were catastrophic. I mean, my mother was dying, and I had to do this piece, and I was give uh, had three weeks, and it was the three weeks during which she died. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very difficult, but I kind of just locked myself away for a couple of few hours a day and thought, well, let's just either I write, don't write the piece at all, or I get it done and um, you just have to force yourself. In his writings about the principles of orchestration, Remsky Korsakov made it clear that talent is something that, that cannot be taught. What is your opinion about talent and teaching composition? Well, exactly that. It can't be taught, but everything can be taught. I mean, without Remsky Korsakov, I was just thinking, uh, he's he sort of more or less implies that, you know, creativity can't be taught and to be a great orchestrator you have to be creative. But then again, he wrote a book on teaching and he taught... The principles of orchestration. You know, Lyadov, Miaskovsky, Stravinsky, Respighi, uh, Prokofiev, and so on. And all of those people ended up as fabulous orchestrators. In fact, they're really much better at orchestration than some of the other composers who could have studied with Rimsky-Korsakov, like Rachmaninoff, and who didn't. I mean, for one reason or another, which I don't know. But all of his pupils were spectacular orchestrators. 
So obviously he managed to teach them, <laughs> despite saying creativity can't Cannot be, be taught. taught. And I think composition is exactly the same, and it's like teaching. The violin can be taught, and it has to be taught. And some people become great violinists, and others don't. And there's so much craft and thought that goes into composition. It's not a gift that just comes down from above. You know, even Mozart had lessons from his father, and right. Mozart gave lessons in composition. You know, he had that English pupil, his name I've forgotten. So obviously Mozart himself felt that composition could be taught and should be. Um, so, and the other thing too is every composer who's any good at all never stops studying. I mean, all of my colleagues who are successful are continually studying it and, and who will, you know, write to you and say, oh, you know, I've just been looking again at the late Beethoven sonatas and I discovered this, this, and this, or, or um, not, maybe not even as sort of obviously serious as that, but... Um, it is know, a lifelong yeah. process of studying. Yeah, I mean, when you study, I mean, that's just an introduction. Uh, 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 a few degrees at the beginning of your studies is just the introduction to the subject. That's true. The subject never stops. And yes. you have to keep on. There will always be something new as well. And there's always something new. Yes. At a certain point that becomes overwhelming though. <laughs> would, would you recommend analyses of existing music compositions as a tool for learning and teaching music composition? Uh, definitely. I mean definitely to begin with I think it's very important. I think the important thing though, which is one of the things I was emphasizing in these lectures, is that it must be clear that composition is not the reverse of analysis. You do not, re it's like reverse engineering, you can't reverse engineer a piece of music. So if you analyze a Beethoven symphony, that doesn't give you a plan for how to set about writing a Beethoven symphony. Well, the writing process is very different. So the analysis is very important as a learning tool, but I think it needs to be emphasized that it's only it's like looking at an image from the other side of the canvas, you know. But to write, to, to create the image, or, or create the painting, you have to start on this end, yes. and the analysis is on the other side. And so it only has limited, um, it's not going to help you write music. In fact, it can be extremely limit, uh, inhibiting. You know, people can be, as you do a lot of analyses of great works, as it were, you know, fantastic pieces of music, and then they end up not able to write anything at all because they're so um, overwhelmed by these other pieces. So do you, do you often see reverse analyses in compositions of younger students? Yeah, I mean, students of composition very often make that mistake, in a way, you know. Bach did this, so I'm going to do something similar. But they, th uh, they think that they know what... I mean, it's an analysis of Bach did this, so I'm going to do the same sort of thing. It's not, I'm sure, not the way Bach actually wrote music. And he didn't analyze what he was going to do in advance, if you see what you know, The mean. analysis that doesn't necessarily tell you the process that the composer yeah, followed. the process is usually quite, quite different. Yes, because you yeah. only sit with the result that you analyze. Yeah. Mm. Um, you recommended composition exercises as a way to practice and improve your technique as composer. And that there is value in doing exercises that do not necessarily relate to your personal preferences or style. So should young composers thus do exercises on 12 tone music, for example? Oh, I think an exercise, I mean, the, the whole point of an exercise is that it shouldn't have any, I mean, I don't think anyone should work on their own style for the first few years, really. I think that it's very important to, it's exactly like piano exercises. You've got to get all the fingers working and all the fingers working equally well. You know, that's the point of piano exercises. Yes. So, um, I... I, I exercises, yes, I mean, when you say 12 tone, that uh, um, immediately implies a, his, 
imitating an historical style and I wouldn't necessarily say that was a good idea. I w would say write a piece using 12 tones but not 12 tone composition because 12 tone composition is a historic period. You see what I mean? Yes. There's a slight difference. Um, but I would say you should definitely try writing tonally and you should definitely try writing atonally and you should definitely try writing noise composition and electronic and you know yes. working with only what using lights on a stage and this <laughs> and is using lighting and nothing else no sound yes yeah. this is often something you can even do on your own and some composers were self-taught and received very little or no training in music uh, prior to their careers as composers among these autodidacts i think about people like telemann wagner elgar Srabchi, schoenberg mm. and do you, what do you think is currently the the importance of a qualification in music, uh, I don't. I don't qualification. No, I mean because that means a degree or a title yes. or something. I don't, think that's, I don't think it's important at all. But you need to study, and you need. To, we're living in completely different times from all of those composers you mentioned. There, you, there are many more composers now than there used to be, and it's a, it's a cutthroat world. I mean, totally cutthroat. And there are thousands and th hundreds of thousands of composers out there trying to make a living. So um, you need to have an edge over your um, your rivals mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, as a young composer, you really need to. And and that edge is education is one of the tools you can use to be yes. if you're better educated than the other. Co Students, it shows immediately. I mean, in competitions and whatever, and uh, ambition is equally important. I think you have to be ambitious, and that uh, by that I mean not ambitious for your career. I think a career is a, si a byproduct of composition. You write good work, you have a career, but so it's about you don't even have to think about your career, but you do have to think about your work, and I think the work is, has to be ambitious. If you come along with little tiny pieces for flute and piano and, you know, pieces that you've been asked to write by friends only and, you know, it shows a lack of vision and a lack of ambition. Yes. Uh, I think being ambitious and productive, working really hard, hard work <laughs> is all the, all the sort of three tools, you know, education, ambition and and uh, stamina. Okay. I mean, and good manners and all the other <laughs> things. Uh, because, you know, reliability is a number one plus. Uh, people who are really gifted but unreliable tend to sink. Yes. <laughs> sink under the, the, you know, the multitude of other people. Mm. If you don't come up with the work on time and perfectly done, you, you're in tr big trouble, no matter who you are. What is your current opinion about transcribing your own works for other instruments? Um, I'm not as fussy as I used to be. I used to prohibit it completely. Uh, uh, but then I, I did some transcription myself of my own stuff and I found the results interesting. And I... I um, I'm much more open to the idea and I find it interesting uh, if you mm. in the sense also that when I came to writing these piano etudes that we did some of there yesterday um, as a pianist I find it difficult to write piano music because the piano repertoire is in my fingers so to speak I mean if you sit down at the piano you automatically have a whole set of other people's music yes. or cliche. So, I mean, one of the first things I did with the piano etudes was to transcribe other works. So one of the etudes yesterday was really a, a transcription and rework, complete reworking of a choral piece. So um, I found that easy then to get into writing piano music without the kind of cliches that yes. are inherent in your hands, you know, practiced into your hands. But getting back to the transcriptions, that can certainly be a way for 
young composers to expand their work lists. Is, is this advisable? Well, it depends entirely on their uh, motivation. If they're just trying to plug their work, I'm not interested. I mean, uh, so many composers have gone down the tube, so to speak, because they've placed their career at the center of, of their activity and not their work. I find most people who devote a lot of energy to their careers and promoting their work end up on the scrap heap. Okay. If you put that same energy into writing really good music, um, you will have a much better career, if you see what I mean. You, yes. You, my attitude has always been, I haven't ever, I mean, until, or oh, with very few exceptions, I've always waited for people to come to me to ask me to write something. I've never gone out and looked for work, as it were. I mean, people, um, it's quite interesting because people ask me to give them some tips and I haven't a clue. Um, but uh, I do, uh, um, well, I, I do think it's, it's always a good idea to write for very good performance. I mean, that's, and, and the advantage of having a career, a good career, is that you get to write work with better and better performance. I mean, you get to work with the best in the world. I mean, that's, that is the, the only advantage of having a, a career or a reputation or a name, is that you work with sensational musicians yes. who offer you a lot. Um, you know, a, a good musician gives you 120% of what you wrote. A bad musician gives you 80% of what you wrote. So it's always been my um, advice is to try and work with the best musicians. Uh, and don't just write something because a friend asks you to write it. Because very often your friend is not necessarily the best musician in, in, on the block. Um, uh, well, they might get a fright when they see the music you wrote for well, them. Well, yes. I mean, there are all kinds of things that can go wrong. Yes. You know. And, and actually to have a catastrophic performance of a piece is very damaging for a composer if you're starting out because you lose confidence in yourself and you lose confidence in your work and you can end up really, you know, not really moving forward because of this yeah. bad experience. You work with fabulous musicians and you're completely overwhelmed by what happens. And I had very good fortune that when I was studying, I mean, I had as friends people who became number one in the world, so to speak. I mean, so as a st my student, fellow students were the best in Europe, at least, in the, what they were doing. And I, I, right from the beginning, I was completely bowled over by the fact that I'd written stuff, and then they came to the first rehearsal, and you say, Ooh, did you bring your scores? And they said, oh, no, no, I, I don't play from scores. I memorized it. Ooh. The first rehearsal, you know, and you think, ooh. <laughs> and, and then when it comes to performance, I mean, they've put everything into it. I mean, in the sense that they also turn up looking fabulous. Wow. And, and they know how to present music, and they know how to walk on the stage, and they know how to uh, control the whole situation. I mean, that's... That's what you get when you work with great performers. Yes, which is something you definitely want as a composer. Well, it, do, it gives you a lot of confidence. I mean, and it, it gives you, it's like such a gift. Yes. You know, these people are giving you presents, as it were. And, for example, one of the players I worked with, who was a famous um, fetal player, she was like number one fetal player in the world at the time, and, uh, which I didn't really realize. And I said, I would like to hear that instrument, you know, with, with vibrato. Because it normally played with that. And she said, well, I mean, do you, what vibrato would you like? Would you like the sort of modern vibrato? Or would you like the French finger vibrato? Or would you like a vibrato by moving the things, or an Arabic vibrato, or this, and so on. And she sort of and talks about up all these seven options. kinds of vibrato I didn't know about. Yes. And then at one point she played through the piece and she said, oh, well, how, how did, did you like that? And I said, yes, that no, was wonderful. 
And she said, but, but. And I said, there are no buts, it was great. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, but you didn't notice that I played the whole piece on two strings in unisono? <laughs> So next time I'm going to play out of tune so you can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and she had tried this out herself, I mean, which takes incredible uh, precision. Yes. Uh, and it changed the color of the instrument by having it played on two different strings at the same time. <laughs> and I hadn't even noticed. But once you pointed it out, you did notice, and you yes. say, well, I love that here, yeah, but let's go on to... Because you could also choose which string you wanted her to play the line on, you know. I mean, that's what happens if you work with a really great musician. If you say, well, the learning curve, the, I mean, what you learn from these people is, is extraordinary. Yes, it is. I, I can just imagine that it, it, it's really special to work with those type of performers. And they are scarce, but once you have them, it is, it's fantastic to have your music performed by them. And you're currently here in South Africa to deliver a series of lectures in, in teaching composition. Um, to whom is this series aimed and have you presented it elsewhere? No, I mean, I'm, I might have done it in different f forms. And of course, it's an ongoing process. Uh, uh, right? It's an ongoing thing, but I, it was really for young composers in here. And by young, I mean people who haven't written a lot of music. I think you can be 60 years old and be a young composer because if you've just been only composing for the last three years, you know. So there's no, um, I mean no offense by the term, mm -hmm. <laughs> young composers, but because I met people before who, who are really, you know, we call mature students and who are composing. So I thought that would be, because I did the Bloemfontein course three years ago or something. 2016. Um, and, you know, I've taught all over the place, and like Princeton and Sweden and uh, Norway and Germany and whatever. Um, uh, I have found that um, there's a lot of hunger out there with young composers who really want to know more. And there are also a lot of extremely lazy composition teachers uh, who basically get the position as lecturer or professor of composition so that they just can do their own work and they do a minimal amount of teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of really neglected students out there. I can imagine because there is a huge difference between teaching composition and practicing composition. So yeah, I mean most, I mean I would say the majority of people composers regard the teaching as being a kind of punishment but they do it so that they have time to do their own uh, financial security to do yes. their own work yes. I mean it, that's it's understandable and it's normal but um, you know I've been teaching since I started teaching the Stockhausen class in the 70s so I like it and I also like I find for every idea I give a, a student, I get ten myself. You know, I mean, it's kind of selfish, but you, ha you, it, it, it stimulates your own creativity yes. to really work with somebody else and work through their problems. And so, by looking at their problems or stuff they're trying to solve, you solve uh, problems that you haven't even had of yet. Your, yeah, of your yeah. own. So it is certainly not, not easy to talk about the comprehensive topics such as composition, uh, especially to a group of people with mixed skills and interests. How did you decide what to include and what to exclude in your lecture series? Well, I, I mean, it was arbitrary in a way. I, I, um, I included a whole lecture on interlocking uh, techniques. techniques because they're African and because we're in Africa so I thought that something that's probably I mean in in the standard academic world that's not something that is focused on I tried to pick topics where I had observed I mean I sat on many many juries of international competitions 
and you observe that there are problems. People have problems in certain areas, so I try to focus on those areas and just dart around and you know just choose some of them. Yes. As you mentioned now, you are on the judging panel of, of many international music competitions <laughs> and festivals. Subsequently, you, you gained lots of insight about the music that young composers from all over the world composes, or what, what they compose, and what they submit for these type of compositions and festivals. Uh, what is your advice for young composers who need to submit something to a panel of judges? Well, yes, I was talking about this. Um, Submitting a work for a competition is quite different from what what you submit for a competition is really should be different from what you do as a serious piece of work because uh, you have to be aware of the fact that a, a competition is judged by usually a maximum of three people uh, over a period of a maximum of three days usually. I mean, sometimes it's five, it's quite rare. Though. Which is a very short time for the many or submissions yeah. you and receive. Yeah, and you get four to six hundred submissions. So um, you have to tell, I mean, my advice is to understand that your piece is only going to get three minutes of attention from the panel. Max! I mean, if you do the arithmetic of how many hours there are, you know, you can't be on the panel for more than eight hours a day. or you brain dead after eight hours. <laughs> so you you know, so it's twenty it's like twenty four hours of of attention to uh, divided into six hundred pieces. It's not a lot of time and, and given that there are breaks and pause. So everything you present has to be flawless and immediately understandable and it it has to you know that the, everyone's gonna start looking at the beginning of the piece rather than somewhere in the middle. So the beginning has to be fabulous. This is not how you should compose, but this is how you win a competition. Yes. Um, the beginning has to be fabulous. You have to, you have to submit a recording of the piece, whether it's MIDI or, or live, because it's much easier for them to judge in three minutes to assess the work. I mean, it's kind of sad. You see so many pieces where oh, the poor person has imagined that you're going to have time to read a 10-page essay and then look at a huge piece. And of course you can't. I mean, you just just not possible. So you spot, 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 spot. And most, most of the judging of any of those things, and it also applies to applying for grants, applying for scholarships, Correct. and applying for positions in a conservatoire or a university. You have no time, I mean, there's very little time allocated to your application. So most of the work done by those committees is looking for a flaw in your application and rejecting it. The process of elimination. Flaw. Yeah, more than looking for the positive. And I gave the example that I had uh, submitted a proposal to the Arts Council of Ireland and they said, you can put examples of your work up, you can just l post a link to YouTube. And I posted a link to SoundCloud and they rejected it because it was only YouTube. I mean, they deliberately put that trap in to eliminate people. And it didn't matter who you were, what your work was, they just... If the link is wrong, it's out. Yeah, it, oh, wrong link, out. So, I mean, they followed a dispute with the Arts Council over this. And now they've changed it the following year that you can have both. But um, that's an example. Yes. Uh, and peop my advice to people, and I mean, I've never entered a competition, really. But I've judged a lot of them. And I think it's a very vicious and cruel process. Um, but do, good people do get through. And I mean, but now you, you have to also realize with winning competition, that almost for sure the person who wins the competition is the second choice. Because there's always a dispute about who's, who the best one is. Two will think the best is great and the third one will say, over my dead body. <laughs> and then the so it all goes to the second, because they all agree on who the second best person is. So it, you, you mustn't stake your life on these things because... And you can obviously not measure your success 
on the results and, of that competition. And you can't, I mean, and especially if you winning a competition is a kiss of death because the next time round, nobody won, you know, they, if they have a festival attached. If you are the featured composer in a festival, it's guaranteed you will not appear in that festival for the next five years. Yes. Because the festivals are all around, well, we've had them, so now we want someone different. Mm. So, I, so many people, it's kind of sad, think, oh, I've won this, this, and this, and this. Where is my career? And there's no career because they, are, uh, these festivals and these competitions eat people up and spit them out. I mean, so, oh yeah, wonderful, winner, winner, don't want them next time. And the other really dangerous thing about them is that for most of them, the cutoff age is 40. So I, when I was uh, um, selecting people for a scholarship for Schloss Solitude, um, that's quite nice because you're a jury member of one and you have absolute power. <laughs> and uh, you're handing out huge amounts of money. So many, up the deadline there is 40 years old. And so many people wrote and saying, you yeah, know, 41, um, but please, can you help me? I don't understand it. I won Darmstadt, I won Gaudiamus, I won this, I won that. And, but nobody's playing my music and this is my last possible chance. Because they reached the age limit and then they were out. Yes. That 40 year age limit, is, 40 years old, is vicious and it's very cruel, and especially to those people who have won all those things because they feel they're doing really well and they're not necessarily doing well. You're only doing well if people take your piece and continue playing it all over the place. Yes. If you win a big competition you have one performance, that, that is not a career. <laughs> one performance <Yes>. does not <laughs> make a career. If you see what I mean. Um, and it's very misleading. Yes. And it, I had really kind of heartbreaking letters from people where you thought, I thought well, I, I, and I had the power to overrule the rules. But I thought, well, there is someone else and they are within the rules and they are be better. So. But you didn't notice that it gives people misperceptions, basically. It does. Yeah. It does. I, I'm very glad I didn't enter competitions. Hmm. Just getting back to your uh, lecture series, I found your lectures very insightful and thought-provoking. Uh, one aspect that came across as a revelation for some of the younger composers was your viewpoint that um, the duration, about the duration of a composition, uh, that is preferably about 20 minutes or even longer. Can you, can you please speak to that? Well, I mean, I'm in a minority here, but in the course of my life I've seen Con serious music shrinking and shrinking and uh, we're at a stage now where it's almost like we no longer if you did a parallel with movies the movie industry no longer exists and we only have music videos because it's all like three four five six seven minute pieces mm -hmm. and I think to in order to arrive at any kind of depth in a piece, with very few exceptions, and they're very, uh, very few exceptional composers. But music needs more time to get into uh, some kind of meaningful discussion, uh, as it were. Um, you know, even Bach took an hour and a half to do, right, The Art of the Fugue is an hour and a half long. But I mean, that's only one tiny example. But, but when I was studying, the the norm for for serious work that the previous generation was doing was anything from forty two minutes to an hour and a half. That's what people were writing. And now, people are writing five to ten minutes. Yes. And for me, that's like a music video. I mean, it's 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 a it's a, like a calling card. You know, here this is what I can do it, but it's not really a, 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 a work in that I think a, a, a serious work of music re requires a more complex structure and needs to go I further into the subject than just suggest something. But you do see these short time limits 
um, for for call of scores, for example. I know that's the problem that the whole ad music administration of music has embraced this thing, and and they are largely responsible, I think, for it, because they are calling for these tiny pieces of music. And I mentioned in my le lecture that I mean. Uh, even as somebody who was a judge of the International World Music Days, I saw the new call and I thought, oh, maybe I should send in a piece. And, and I had no, not one single work out of 140, as you say, I've written. Mm. I thought it was more like 120, but anyway. I think it's uh, 100 th 137, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Oh, really? Well, thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, I didn't have a single piece that was short enough to fit into the, the call for scores. So I was excluded on that basis. Uh, and I think this is wrong, and I think one should write to the committee and say, unacceptable. You know, they are using everything. They are, they're using budget as an excuse. You know, oh, we haven't got the budget for larger pieces, and, and we um, want to give everyone an opportunity. But uh, as I said in the lectures, can you imagine going to a major museum, like you go to the Louvre and it's just millions of little tiny miniatures? Yeah. Because the curator thinks, well, we must give everyone a chance and we can, have, we can only hang tiny pictures because there's not enough room or we haven't got the budget to put up big paintings. I mean, that's rubbish, it's bullshit. <laughs> and something like the World Music Days has no business uh, calling for miniatures. What, what amounts to miniatures? Uh, and it's this, this is catastrophic thinking. I mean, they are destroying the art of composition by making, putting these restrictions on things. Yes. Um, the lecture series was rounded off with a concert of your music by Waldo Alexander and Joel Richards. Uh, is there a connection between these works and your lecture series? Not really. I mean, it, it, the, because I was coming to do the lectures, I also knew that, I mean, Jill and I knew that I have time to work with her beforehand on the etudes and stuff. And I had written that piece for Valdo for his 40th birthday. And Spur. I've never heard it before and never worked on it with them and all that. So it was it was wonderful of them to put on that concert, but that wasn't really my doing. They decided to do it and then uh, we used the opportunity. I mean that I was here and then we all three of us together in the same city at the same time, which yes. was quite rare, uh, to to work on certain pieces. And the pieces were fantastic and they were very well received by the audience. And I was curious to know, how would your music have been different uh, if you s remained living in South Africa? Well, I think it would be radically different. I mean, if I lived here uh, now, I mean, you say now, I, I, I can't imagine what would have happened if I had been living here since the 80s, because everything's gone in a different way. But if I lived now, here now, I would firstly become an activist of some kind because um, try and fi get more funding for contemporary music specifically. I mean, to somehow milk the wealth in this country, I mean, which is staggering wealth. And there's so many people with grotesquely excess amounts of money that there must be a way of getting somebody <laughs> to give something to help. But then I would also, I would work with um, local materials being, local materials being like choirs, uh, choral stuff, um, work with uh, start projects that would, I mean large scale projects, but with, with minimal means. So the kind of music you could play on the street or I mean, or even digging, you know, like trying to meet some gifted street kids and so on, and forming a group. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, there's all these wonderful dance companies. I, there's no kind of excuse because it's been done in dance, it's been done in theatre. I'm thinking the basket. It's, it's been done in basket. Orchestras. But I know, see no composer's initiative to work with the, the, this huge community of active 
enthusiastic, gifted people uh, to start a sort of big project with um, with it's new music with with yeah kids maybe but new music yeah I mean um, you've seen I mean the successes that people have had like Handspring Puppet Company they're really world famous and they've evolved their style um, their puppets and all that thing themselves with a small group over the years and ended up as as you know, I mean, from a popular point of view, more famous than William Kendridge, with these amazing shows like War Horse. And you think, if they can do that, why can't we, why haven't we got a sensational percussion ensemble? And I mean, for percussion, you know, as I, I played this piece, done on three cardboard boxes, supermarket, yes. and a wonderful piece, but what I mean, you could have cardboard boxes, you could have there's so many gifted people here who make like beautiful objects out of telephone wire. You could employ people, or you, you know, I mean, when I say employ, I don't mean pay either. I mean, you could get people interested to In make, music make new instruments and, and develop a fantastic ensemble because there's no lack of talent. There's loads yes. of talent. And then, of course, we have all these phenomenal singers, and many of whom, I mean, like opera singers, many of whom are unemployed and they're still living here and they're unemployed uh, the resources are enormous so I think I would have I would rethink completely how I work I mean I'm everything I write now is for major ensembles or orchestras in Europe and America or whatever but because that's where I live but if I lived here I would have to rethink it completely I mean, I get quite cross that nobody's doing this in the younger generation. And they're doing music for soirees and for, but it's all sort of middle class suburban stuff. And, and it, if you want to really make it as a composer worldwide, you have to produce something unique and sensational. <laughs> I love that word of Morton Feldman used it all the time, sensational. I mean, I think it has to be sensational because there's no reason why it shouldn't be sensational. And that will be a way to, to draw your audience members. Yes, I mean, you could create a new audience. Yes. I, think, I mean, I think probably one of the first things I would do, or try and do, and to, if I was an activist and trying to get money, is to have to start an independent little radio station for contemporary music. Because nothing like a radio station for creating an audience. And you could make, I mean, you, could, you know, contemporary music could be a bit varied, but not uh, not wallpaper. I mm. mean, serious stuff. And it doesn't, as far as I know, it doesn't cost much at all to have a contemporary music radio station. Well, yeah. with the with the technology these days, yeah, something like an your, online station. You do it from your possible. bedroom, yeah. Yes, and. Uh, you know, it was interesting, years ago, Kronos Quartet, I mean, became world famous. And, but they started off by becoming famous in the United States because they had a radio show. And they had a radio, I mean, like a weekly or bi-weekly radio show. And they used to just get in one car and then drive around America and do all the concerts in all the small towns. And they said, wherever we went, had an audience because people had heard us on the radio. Yes. So they created an audience and then turned up and did a live show. And I think that's a wonderful yes. a sort of lesson. To start somewhere. Yeah, so. and I mean, and they started with nothing and became superstars mm -hmm. in contemporary music. So it can be done. I think it just takes a, a rethink to get away from the academic idea that, you know, you're going to do a doctorate and then you're going to write a string quartet or something. I mean, there are lots of string players here, and you could do a string quartet, but there are other things you could do. And, you know, I mean, with string quartet, you have to be aware of the fact that the instruments are very valuable, and therefore you can't, you, you know, that limits the venues, and that limits what, you know... How much Coligna they can really play. <laughs> yes, and all kinds of things, but if you know what I mean, it immediately moves into uh, a kind of protected environment. Um, 
And if then you move into the world of grand pianos, which I love. I mean, we had that sensational piano yesterday, but now we're That's talking funny. of a couple of million rand for one instrument. Well, you know, you can build an awful lot of homemade instruments for a couple of million rand. Um, there are pianos and there are stuff, but there, I mean, the proportion between that, that kind of exclusive a sound source and all the available sound sources for a composer to work with uh, is, I mean, there's something off balance here. And when I think of people like Cargill doing a major work commissioned by Berlin Opera, um, his piece repertoire, which we did in Durban, which involves five screens and four musicians and 100, or I think 400, props made out of scrap, rubbish, you mm -hmm. know, which we got somebody, uh, a friend, uh, um, Pierce, Ellis Pearson, made these wonderful props and we put on a really serious major work of contemporary music costing more or less nothing. I mean very little. And and, and Cargill when he wrote this piece was one of the major composers of the of of Europe at the time and one of the biggest commissions. I mean in you know Berlin Opera a serious and he did, did a very important work. Mm. So you want to say well why don't you do something like that? Yes. And then you don't have to, I mean, with a piece like that, all you need is a big enough space. And that could be out on the street or... It can be anywhere. It can be anywhere, yeah. really. Kevin, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you thank for you. your lectures. <laughs> I, I really recommend that people listen to your music. If anyone ever has the opportunity to attend one of your lectures, I would highly recommend them to do so. It really changed people's lives. Um, thank you very much and all of the best with your yeah, travels. Yeah.